Hey horror fans, welcome back to Room 237, and um, kind of a random review. Um, if you've been following lately, you know I've been going through watching Blumhouse films, films of the like, you know, shitty supernatural films, whatever. Blumhouse or non-Blumhouse films that feel like Blumhouse, Polaroid, Winchester, shit like that. Well, this is a film that, scrolling through Hulu, I've seen it on there. It's a 2019 film. And just, I had it in my mind, it's like, I'm willing to bet it's another film like that. Because it's not Blumhouse. Definitely not Blumhouse. But I thought, it's going to be one of those just as bad films. And then I read about it, and it got some decent reviews. And I watched it, and... It was a breath of fresh fucking air. That is 2019's The Lodge. I don't like this cover. I'd much rather see the thumbnail that's on Hulu, which is like a shot of the lodge window with her, the kids, and snow. I like that more. Uh, directed by Veronica Franz and Severin Fiala who, of course, directed a... They both directed the film, the German-language film, Good Night, Mommy, from 2014, which I never saw. Um, I'm guessing this is similar. Um, I've been meaning to check it out, though, so don't tell me I should, because I plan on seeing it at some point. It's actually a Hammer film. You know, this is one of those modern... Hammer revival attempt films like uh, Let Me In back in 2010. I actually forgot about that. It was start starting and I saw Hammer and I was like, oh, that's fucking cool. And it's good. So that makes me feel awesome. Stars uh, Riley Keogh, if I pronounce that correctly. Uh, Jaden Martell, who played young Bill Denbro in the new It films. Lisa McHugh, Richard Armitage, and a brief appearance by Alicia Silverstone. And this movie is a psychological horror film, and it was it was made for two point seven million dollars. Now I want this to be a lesson. Two point seven is very cheap. This movie has atmosphere. It's just oozing with atmosphere to the brim with atmosphere very well done methodical tension and dread i don't remember one jump scare one slight jump scare but it felt earned and I, i'll get to that that cheap no cgi just this this is what happens when you get competent directors and writers because it was also written by the two directors and Sergio Kosky. I'm guessing that's how you pronounce it. You can make very well done, effective horror films that cheap. It got decent reviews. I mean, it has a 73 on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, consistently praised for its atmosphere, its tension, its constant feel of dread and unsettling nature i agree with all that since i haven't seen good night mommy i will have to equate it to a little bit of the shining in setting but also hereditary it actually has a lot of hereditary in it but i i I might like this more than Hereditary. Hereditary, I think, was more uh, consistently unsettling and more so unsettling throughout. But this had a much better ending and s consistent story, at least I think. Of course, this is part of a new movement or genre called elevated horror or intellectual horror, which I've touched upon before. 
I'm gonna make a video talking about that because when I look at films that have that title, yes, yeah, some of them have very deep, well done writing, whether it be something like The Witch, which is all old English from journals and testimonies from the 1600s, or something like Get Out, Quiet Place, whether it be allegorical or just very socially competent films, intellectually written films. But it's also given one, given to films that really take its time with pace. They're usually slower paced. Good writing, atmosphere, tension. It takes its time with every aspect of what makes a horror movie work. Not just jump scares and dream fake-out sequences. Basically, you have the Blumhouse films and ones like it that I've been doing, and then intellectual ones. Which is really like, okay, so you have a film that takes its time to be good, and it's called elevated or intellectual. I don't know if that says more about producers and studios or the audiences. I'm leaning towards the audience because there's also something called short attention span theater. I don't want to shit on anyone, but yeah. Uh, I think calling just well-made films intellectual has more to do with the common mainstream audience at least in the last 10 years at least so the story is uh, Richard uh, Richard Armitage and Bill from the new It movies and his younger sister their parents are separated his father left their father left their mother Alicia Silverstone when he was doing research on this book about this radical religious cult, that's a lot like the Heaven's Gate cult, which if you don't know what the Heaven's Gate cult is, there's a good documentary about it in this as part of the uh, two-part Rampage series, part on uh, religious killings. Check that out. But it was a... Uh, Religious cult read by, led by uh, uh, Marshall Appleby and, and Bonnie Nettles from 74 to 97. They, all, they believed in UFOs coming to get them. You know, UFOs was their heaven. They committed mass suicide. And anyway, this woman, Grace, that he met, played by, uh, what did I say, Riley Keogh. Riley Keogh is Grace. She was in the cult when she was 12. And she was the lone survivor. Apparently, well, I, I'm not going to get into spoilers. Because I don't want to spoil this. Because I love movies like this. Slower pace, tension filled, atmospheric. Yeah, I, I didn't like it as much as The Witch or The Lighthouse. But... I'll probably say those two, then this. Um, it Comes at Night. I really enjoyed. Uh, then maybe Hereditary, other than the ending. And then ones like Get Out, <sighs> Quiet Place. You know, as far as those intel intellectual. I don't even get mad at that title. It's like, yeah, they're smarter because they're well made. He reveals to Alicia Silverstone that he's going to marry her. They He left her for her. They started dating. Now he's going to marry her. She commits suicide. And it, it tears apart the family. And that's one of the reasons why it's like hereditary. Grief plays a huge part in this movie. And it's very minimalist as far as, you know, music, um, there are shots in this film that you can fucking frame with how beautiful they are. I mean, the scene when the daughter is just bawling her eyes out in bed over the grief, the loss of her mother. She pushes the dad away because he's trying to calm her down. And then the brother comes in and he lays next to her and he just holds her hand. And the camera just kind of pulls back with this very subtle yet open music of just 
this really dramatic sound. It really, it, it's subtle, but it opens the film up intensely. He tells the kids, you know, okay, for Christmas, we're going to go up to, you know, the, the lodge in uh, Massachusetts. And he's like, but I got to stay behind to do stuff. So you're going to be alone with her for a couple days. Of course, the kids hate that idea. And also the girl has a dollhouse that we kind of see the inside of the dollhouse, which is a replica of the lodge. So that's a little bit more hereditary in there. And we don't see Grace right off. I mean, when she comes up to the house, she's outside. We see her talking to the dad and hugging. But the windows create like this out of focus, fuzzy um, silhouette. They were in the car, they're in the car waiting for her. She walks up and we see her through the rear window, but there's ice and frost, so we can't really see her. It's almost like setting up a villain, like a horror villain. Or we're supposed to see her through the eyes of the children. Because they do research on her. After they're told they're going to be spending time with her. And that's where they find out about her past with the cult. And their time alone with her in the cult is really like The Shining. It's like in setting, because they're out in this lodge out in the snow during a blizzard you have the isolation you have like resentment and bad feelings because of course they already don't like her just because of that sort of family dynamic grief and troubled family another hereditary but again I gotta say I like this more than hereditary it is just this constant build up of dread and unsettling because you know there's something wrong with her and it's another one of those movies kind of like oculus where you know it plays with okay is this uh, something supernatural like did she br bring something with her or is there really something or is she just completely nuts and delusional and it plays with that for a while, and I, I like that. Of course, it does have a definite answer at the end, which way, which is fine. But, you know, there is a scene where, she, you know, she's been laying down, the dad comes in to hug her, she has her pills, and she hides them. So we get the idea she is fucked up. I, I shouldn't say fucked up. That, that's me. She, she is mentally ill. And so that's why it sets up perfectly... You know, which I thought Hereditary was... I, I've talked about Hereditary a bunch of times. Go watch my review for that. I'm going to get into spoilers now. And even in spoilers, I'm not going to go over every aspect. But um, I highly recommend this. If you liked... If you liked those elevated, intellectual, better than Blumhouse <laughs> films. Uh, better than mainstream films. Like The Witch. You know, I... The Witch and Hereditary, The Shining, then definitely check this out. You are going to like it. Or Oculus, of course. I like... I probably like this more than all those films, but The Shining, because that is my favorite film. But it's on Hulu. Yes, it is very slow-paced, but trust me, if you like those films, stick with this. Don't, don't be a patron to short attention span theater. There's a ton of great films out there that get the hyperbolic treatment of being called garbage and trash just because there's sh not shitty jump scares every five minutes. It takes its time with characters and development, acting, atmosphere, tension, dread, earned scares, story, which yes, there is some sweater thread writing in this where if you pull the thread it all falls apart yes because yeah he does know this girl was part of a fucked up cult and I was gonna leave them alone with her kids in this isolated lodge during Christmas 
yeah, if you think about it, it doesn't make sense. It can kind of ruin it. Almost kind of makes you think of the mom from Shyamalan's The Visit. But I do believe that if a movie is as well done in every other aspect, even in writing other than that part, like if a movie's really good, you can kind of forgive the flaws, which is why when a movie's shitty, you notice all the flaws. I, I, I really loved this. I really enjoyed this film. It was a, a breath of fresh fucking air since all those supernatural Blumhouse and otherwise films I've been watching. But spoilers. Um, so, like, when they're... When it's just her and the kids, you know, it's obvious the kids aren't a fan of her. She's trying. I mean, she is sweet and trying in the beginning. Yes. But the kids show interest that they don't give a shit. And they're even... They're watching John Carpenter's The Thing, which is... One, really cool, and two, kind of funny that they're watching it in that situation. Uh, you know, the son brings in the gas heater for the sister. They all fall asleep, and she has this dream. And during this dream, oh my god, she's out on the ice. The camera just keeps pulling back, and you just get that perfect horizon line of white for the snow where she is and then just this black and the camera just keeps pulling back ever so slowly and, and we just see that landscape spreading more and more with that subtle unsettling music love the score to really helps this movie out intensely and you know a vision being pulled under the ice by the cult leader. But then when she wakes up, everything is gone. All the food is missing. All their clothes, her meds, their phones don't work. She blames it on them. They say they haven't done it yet. And this is where the whole, is she doing this herself? Is it supernatural? Because they kind of hinted that she's seeing things like sin and repent in the smoke on the or the steam excuse me on the mirror during a shower she thinks the sun has been watching her in the shower the one jump scare is i think the daughter is walking around or like it's up the camera is kind of pulling through this dark lodge which the lodge is beautiful looking by itself especially when it's dark and it's just the glow of the fireplace and the camera pans over, and it's been silent, and we see her far off at in a room at the end of the hall just tapping a piano loudly. That's like the only real jump scare. And that's another thing that I really like these shots because you don't get a whole lot of close-ups. You do, but you don't. The really intense scenes are not close-up, like older movies. Like, there's a, a scene where, when she finally breaks down, she finds that her dog has froze to death outside. And she's sitting on the porch, and the daughter's crying because she left the door open. It's her fault. And she's trying to get her to go back inside. But, you know, they're sitting on the porch here. And the camera's already back here, but the camera just keeps pulling back and pulling back. And again, with that music, it just fucking helps. She keeps having all these visions, like the kids telling her. Well, first she just keeps snapping. Like she hears the daughter talking. If she goes and she's on the phone, she like pulls it away from her. Like, really? Your phone fucking works? And when she takes it, it is dead. She says she was, she was uh, pretending to talk to dad. So it's like those shining kind of Amityville moments like that, where it seems like she's cracking. And then, you know, just, it all, it all does lead up to the kids eventually, you know, she goes inside after she's clearly snapping and they're like praying and there's this 
article with the obituaries of the two kids and the dad and they just keep telling her to repent and of course she flips out and then that's when she's outside on her knees walking in circles on the ice and the snow which you get is like shot from above which looks great that's when she finds the dog and and like I said, it's methodical, like The Shining or The Witch. Like, you don't have something super crazy in the beginning, then something subtle, and then it gets more crazy. It's just gradual the whole time. And I mean, grief, you know, the family problems, grief, uh, the kids not liking the fiancé, but the fiancé trying with the kids. It's just this awkward, unsettling sense of dread and when you mix in the isolation and all of that it really works perfectly also there's no power along with everything missing but also right before she finds them praying with the obituary he tells her that he had a dream that they all died for carbon monoxide from the gas heater and to get her to come inside or after she comes inside after the dog dies they said they've done everything they planted it in her head to drive her crazy they they drugged her so she would fall asleep so they can hide everything in the lodge they they did make the little article they yeah they were praying at one point you know, right after she yells at the sun for saying repent, repent, after finding them praying with the obituaries, he hangs himself. But of course, it's rigged to look like he's hanging himself. And after he looks like he's dead, he looks up, he's like, keep telling her to repent. You know, looks like a vision or like a delusion. And then that's when she... And they keep playing, like, the sermons for the cult throughout on a speaker. So it's, she thinks it's in her head. And then eventually, their phones really do die. Because, like, two days have gone by. And the generator won't start. And um, they, they give her back her meds. And... This is when she really starts going nuts because they go to check on her and she's like kneeling on these logs in front of the fireplace that are all hot embers. I think it's called a uh, self-flagellation when you like hurt yourself in the name of, you know, penance, I guess. And the kids hide up in the attic, which I love the shot of the attic, this big open attic. Where the window in the middle just sort of has like this vanishing point light. And the bed is right in the middle where the kids are. And we see their view way off in this big open attic is the stairway right in the middle where we see her just rise up. Oh, it's like a Kubrick shot. And again, sort of like the scene in the beginning when the daughter's grieving and the brother lays with her. It holds on her forever. The camera does hold on a lot of characters during a lot or holds on the characters a lot of the time to really build that sense of, okay, what's not okay, something's wrong, and to build that dread even if it's not there yet. So, like, it's like grief up until dread and tension. It's just unsettling throughout this whole movie. And I love that. I love the pace. And then, of course, eventually... She brings the girl's beloved doll up, and this is when she's all messed up. She's finally snapped, and she has the uh, the dad's pistol, which she taught her to use before she left, so uh, foreshadowing, saying they have to burn something for sacrifice. At this point, the dad shows up. And to prove to him that they are in purgatory, pulls a gun on herself, but it clicks. 
She's like, see, I'm already dead. But then she shoots and kills him. Kids try to get away. Get stuck in the snow. She brings him inside. She sings some uh, religious song. Puts duct tape with the word sin on their mouth as they're crying, sitting there silently. Because when the people committed mass suicide, they put that on. Then the camera just has a, this long shot and the pistol on the table. And it's like, did she use it? Doesn't say. I know I kind of went through the story really fast. But, you know, I, I love movies where, <clears throat> you know, that's the psychological aspect. Okay, this you can call a psychological horror film. Now, psychological thriller is still a fucking horror film. Psychological horror because it does play with your head as well. A lot of people think psychological has to do with what the character is going through, but also the audience. Like, we don't know what's real or not. We don't know if it's supernatural or some higher power deal going on. We don't know if she is doing it and doesn't realize it because she's fucking crazy or what force is making all this stuff happen. And nothing that happens is so blumhousey and crazy that you can't believe it. We, we don't see any ghosts. There's no CGI ghosts or beings or anything like that. The little bits we do see of maybe someone being there looks like one of the other characters. Very, very, very subtle, which is a subtlety. Subtlety is excellent. So I love movies. It's like, okay, like the movie is like, okay, it, it's either supernatural or someone else is doing it. We don't quite know. But then at the end, we do find out. But there's also the ambiguity. Is she going to use the gun? Or is she gaslighting them like they did her? Maybe looking too much into that. But this movie, I mean, go ahead and call it elevated and intellectual. It deserves it. But, you know, it's also just doing what any horror movie film... The horror movie film. Yeah, talk about intellectualism. I'm an idiot. Any good horror film should do. Any filmmaker should do. One, take your time across the board on everything so it's good. This movie is crazy with atmosphere. Excellent with atmosphere. The, the slow pace, it's an hour 48 minutes. But it takes its fucking time with the pace. It's methodical. Again, like The Shining or The Witch. And I love that as well. I love slow paced movies, especially when they're earned. And, you know, just going and just the camera work, whether it holds a shot or it's pulling back or it's already a far away shot, it really helps sustain that dread and tension and unsettling feeling. One critic even said it's unsettling on a subconscious level because it's so methodical and slow paced. It's like, you might not even realize if you're unsettled in the moment, but then you're just like, oh, well, yeah, that kind of was unsettling. The very subtle, almost Carpenter-esque music, It Follows, because I said Carpenter-esque music made me think of It Follows. It, it Follows. Another wonderful intellectual horror film. Great movie. It's a subtle score, but... Mixed with the wonderful cinematography. You know, I will say Hereditary probably does have better cinematography and bigger scares, but this has a better story, infinitely more atmosphere, and a much better ending. Yes, it does have the sweater thread story in the beginning, where it's like, oh, you're, it's like, oh, you're, you're just gonna. Leave your kids alone with someone from a psycho cult, and then it all falls apart. <laughs> but every aspect works so well that you can forgive it. I really enjoyed this film. I love films of this kind anyway, you know, for all the reasons I just said. I don't think I can hype it up enough. In fact, I'm sure there shouldn't have leave it out. Recommend it, you know, in every sense of the word. Again, I... The last 10 years, 
movies like this, yes, I still like The Witch even more. I like The Lighthouse even more. But I was blown away by this movie. I real I was expecting another shitty Blumhouse type film, supernatural film. And this gave me yet another shining type. I mean, shining mixed with hereditary. I can't say goodnight mommy because I haven't seen it yet, but I'm about to run out of time because I'm at 30 minutes, but hope you enjoyed this review. I hope I got to everything that I do like about it. If not, I hope you enjoyed it anyway. If you stuck through the review and haven't seen it, I hope you watch it anyway. Let me know what you think about Evelated uh, and... Uh, Evelated. Jesus Christ, I can't talk today. Elevated. Elevated or intellectual humor. What you thought of this film. I... I and I just, I can't say how much I love and respected this movie enough. Especially with the reviews I've done lately. Breath of fresh fucking air. We need more horror films like this. I, I was blown away. Thank you for watching.